In the Presbytery of Detroit, um, in which you belong, there are 79 PCUSA churches, and on average, uh, these 79 churches host 8,538 worshipers. Uh, that means that in the average church, um, on an average week, there are 108 people in worship. We are currently averaging about 100 people uh, in worship. So right now, in terms of budget and attendance, we are an average church in our presbytery. And I was wondering, how do you feel about being right in the middle? Even though you hide it, well, I bet there's some of you uh, who are secretly frustrated uh, that our church is not bigger. You've been here for years, and you think that there's a lot that God has planned for this church. You want more people to gather, more people to follow Jesus here. Why are we only average? There was no scandal. There was no crisis. Everyone tried to be faithful. Everyone was nice to the newcomers. And some of you are thinking, we are overdue for growth. You expect more people to come in any day now, any day. And perhaps some of you are not frustrated yet. You've been busy, and your friends, your close friends, have had other priorities, and church is literally the last thing that you would get competitive about. But imagine that you decide it's time to get serious about church. Imagine you commit to this church for the next 20 years with renewed vigor and hope. You continue to be faithful. You extend a warm welcome to newcomers. You participate in church events. You decide to embrace the nice, young, energetic pastor and pray for his family. You ask a friend to redo the website. You teach another volunteer how to upload the sermons online. You share ideas for an outreach activity. From doing the dishes to developing a stewardship campaign, you resolve, I'm going to do it all. I'm going to be involved. And two decades go by. And we are all 20 years older. Some of our members have had to move. And some are now too old to drive. And imagine that despite 20 years of faithful service, not many have joined our church. And we are down to 50 people and dwindling. That is the experience of many of our peers in ministry. They recognized that there was a problem. They prayed. They brainstormed, they came up with a solution, an action plan at least, and they believed, they showed up, they sacrificed, and they prayed some more. But even though they were faithful, many have had to close their church, and many more are struggling just to keep the lights on. Imagine you were sitting here having done your best, unsure of what else you could have done, and imagine that this is your last Sunday worship before you close the doors one final time and hand over the keys to some real estate agent. Can you imagine feeling just a little bit frustrated with God? If so, you might be able to understand the frustration that was in the hearts of the disciples of John the Baptist in today's passage. Let's turn to verse 22 and 23. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he spent, some time with, he spent some time there with them and baptized. John also was baptizing at Anah near Salim because water was abundant there, and people kept coming and were being baptized. In today's passage, we see John the Baptist faithfully doing the ministry that he received from God. John is called the baptizer because that's his calling, to, to baptize. And in verse 23, we see John baptizing as you should. But only a few are coming. People used to stream to him, but now there's just a trickle. And the answer why is given in verse 22. It's because Jesus is baptizing. No one is going to John because everyone is going to Jesus. All are going to him. How do you think that makes John feel? John is like a cupcake baker who tells everyone, I give you cupcakes, but there is a man coming after me whose apron I am not worthy to untie. He will do more than you can ever imagine. Follow him. And John thought Jesus would do something more fancy like seven-layer cakes or creme brulee or something. John thought Jesus would be headed to some major city, some faraway culinary destination. But no, Jesus comes back 
and decides to make cupcakes right next to John. John did everything he could to honor Jesus. John was always telling the crowd that someone better was coming. And after meeting Jesus, John finally gets to say, and now he's here. Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I am not worthy to tie, even untie his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire. There is real passion and enthusiasm in the way that John lifts up Jesus, and he does such a good job that right then and there, some of his disciples leave him to start following Jesus. And John is genuinely happy that some of his disciples have gone on to help and participate in Jesus' ministry. And at first, things go as John expects. In Jesus' first public miracle, Jesus turns water into wine at Cana. This and other miracles show the disciples and the crowds that Jesus is truly the Messiah, God's anointed, and he begins to have more momentum and more authority. And then John hears about Jesus going to the temple in Jerusalem and driving out the money changers and merchants who were turning the house of prayer for all nations into a den of thieves. John is probably chuckling to himself as he hears about how Jesus made a whip out of ropes and drove out all of the animals and overturned the tables of the money changers. He's chuckling and wondering, where will Jesus go next? From Jerusalem to Alexandria, perhaps, the center of learning in the ancient world? Or perhaps Jesus would be headed to Rome, the center of political power. Where would Jesus go and what would Jesus do? The sky's the limit. Jesus could be anywhere, could be doing anything. But after his bold prophetic work in the temple in Jerusalem, Jesus comes back to this quiet area in the countryside by the Jordan River, right next to where John the Baptist is ministering. Jesus doesn't come back to say, hey, thank you for your support back then. He comes back to do exactly what John is doing. And as you might expect, the crowds leave John and go to Jesus. After all, would you want to be baptized by John the Baptist or by Jesus? Everybody was saying Jesus. John John was a little bit surprised, I think, by Jesus' move here. Yo, cuz, of all the ministries in all the world, you have to do this? And even though he doesn't express it, I'm sure John is a little bit frustrated as his ministry is dwindling. And perhaps he wants to complain to God the Father, God, you gave me a small part to play, and I'm trying to do it faithfully. But now it looks like even the little that you asked me to do is not even needed. John was glad to make his contribution and give his service, but now even that humble work seems unnecessary because of what Jesus is doing. Why did Jesus do this? John has no idea. But part of the answer is given to us, the readers, in the next verse, in verse 24. John, of course, had not yet been thrown into prison. A time is coming when John will not be able to minister because his life will be serving God in a different way uh, through a witness in prison and through martyrdom. And Jesus is raiding the Israelites to confess their sins and experience repentance without the benefit of John the Baptist's ministry. That and other reasons, such as Jesus' disciples, they needed to know that calling that their calling was not just to meet the felt needs of the crowd but to call the crowds into repentance being a disciple of jesus is not just about handing out food and care packages and calling people to be healed it is also proclaiming the holiness of god and allowing the light of god to expose the darkness lurking in every human heart so jesus has his reasons but the disciples of John the Baptist are never told those reasons, and they especially are getting frustrated. We see their frustration in verse 25 and verse 26. Now a discussion about purification arose between John's disciples and a Jew. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the one who was with you across the Jordan to whom you testified, here he is baptizing, and all are going to him. My assumption is that they are used to teaching about purification. 
They were sharing based upon the authoritative curriculum that John the Baptist created. Usually, when someone comes down to the riverside to be baptized, they are like a baby bird accepting food from the mother bird. The teacher does the teaching, the baby bird does the receiving, and it's a very one-sided conversation because the person that is at the riverside confessing their sins, they're just asking, tell me, tell me what I need to do. Guide me, guide me into the life change that I must have. But all of a sudden, a discussion is taking place. A discussion about purification arose. It's not teachers and learners. It's a discussion of people who consider themselves somewhat equal to one another. There is a shift, a jarring shift for the disciples of John. And it's a shift that I think that those of us in the church are familiar with. If you are not ready to discuss... If you are not ready to be questioned and challenged, if you are only ready to teach, then you are going to have a hard time ministering to the millennials and to the younger folks. They do not respond to top-down content delivery if there is no space for discussion. We have our traditions, but they want to bring that tradition into conversation with other traditions. We are delivering an idea, but they want to see how that idea intersects with the other ideas that are in culture. And like some of us, the disciples of John the Baptist were, were homesick for the good old days when ministry was simpler, when people came humble, when people were wanting to learn to be taught what to do. But these days, people are just wanting to discuss. If you don't really know your tradition, discussions are threatening. But if you actually know your stuff, discussions are an opportunity to bring out the nuances of your position. If you don't really love people, discussions are annoying because if you just can't wait to build a crowd, a discussion feels so inefficient. But if you love people, discussions are an opportunity to recognize the fingerprints of God in the life of the other as they ask those questions and as they share their assumptions. If we are constantly learning and constantly loving, we can celebrate good theological discussions. But the fact that people are looking for discussions rather than instructions these days, it seems to frustrate John's disciples. It's one aspect of the changing context of their ministry. Of course, the more obvious change for them is the size of the crowds. As I stated before, John's disciples are crying out with frustration, all are going to him. There are only a few people left, and those few are expecting discussions rather than accepting instructions. And John's disciples are frustrated, longing for those good old days, but John the Baptist refuses to give them permission to criticize Jesus or rebel against what what God has ordained. John is still content to faithfully minister in this new context. I believe it's partly because John the Baptist knows his stuff and he loves each person. He can be okay with this. But more than that, John can let go of his frustration because he knows his potential. If you know that your potential is to do great things, you are frustrated when you are doing mediocre things. If you know you can run 10 miles in an hour, you will be bored jogging six miles per hour. However, if you have cerebral palsy and you know that your potential is to go less than one mile per hour, then you would be ecstatic if you found yourself walking three miles per hour. It all depends on your sense of your own potential. I was watching a video of a kid with cerebral palsy who, after weeks with a trainer, was able to walk for the first time. He went less than one mile per hour, just a step, a stumbling step, every couple seconds. But it was inspiring. John is not frustrated because John knows that his potential, apart from God, is to convert exactly zero people and to lead zero people into repentance and to be leading a community of zero followers. Which is why in verse 27, John answered, No one can receive anything except what has been given from heaven. 
if we are frustrated, we are assuming that some power or privilege that belongs to us has been taken from us. But John is content because he knows that the power and influence always belong to God. Always, only those pulled by the grace of God have ever shown up at the riverside. And down by that river, John and his disciples always only had charisma, insight, or teaching ability, only as God allowed. The disciples of John, they had zeal, they had motivation. All of them were making considerable sacrifices to be joining in John's ministry. But those with zeal and motivation to do great things for God often lack peace. The lack of peace is hidden when ministry is busy, but that lack of peace is revealed when the crowds thin out. What happens in your heart when the fig tree does not bud and no fruit is on the vines? What happens when the sheep are cut off from the fold and no cattle are in the stalls? Those with zeal, those with motivation will look for a way to solve the problem. They will brainstorm ideas to implement. They will be spiritually active as well. They'll beat their hearts and say, God, tell me what sin I have to confess. They will look for some command to follow some promise to cling to. But sometimes, God is not looking for us to implement the solution. God is simply asking us to endure a situation. Sometimes God wants us to endure, to hear the groaning of a creation waiting for the day when the children of God will be revealed in glory. Sometimes God wants us to endure as it was with Hosea. God wants us to know the ache of the lover's heart when that love is scorned. What should worshipers do when their church is in crisis? Surely we should have zeal and motivation. Of course we should look for ways to solve the problem. We should ask God for directions while hurrying to do what we can. But as we pray, sometimes we discover that God is not asking for us to come up with a solution. God is asking us if we are willing to endure the situation. God has us look. Look on a brother who is struggling and ache for him. That brother genuinely wants to get his life back on track. But that life keeps on spiraling out of control. That brother is impatient, and we are too impatient for him to stop falling and to start leading in the church. But it is enough just to faithfully love and encourage. God doesn't ask us to solve that person's problem. God's will is for us to hear the ache of all creation as the very rocks groan for him to be revealed as a resurrected child of God. God has us sometimes holding bulletins, waiting for newcomers that don't come. God has us sometimes out at H Mart, handing out flyers, inviting passerbys to engage while they politely or not so politely ignore us. We are snubbed, we are disappointed, and in so doing, we are asked to endure and know a little bit of God's heart. Christians who are faithful and have no outward success to show for it They're asked to pray Habakkuk chapter 3. Though the fig tree does not bud and no fruit is on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though the sheep are cut off from the fold and no cattle are in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. What does that look like? There's a deacon praying while turning off lights and cleaning up classrooms that only get used by rowdy kids playing hide-and-seek. God, what do you want me to do so that our church can grow, so that every room can be filled with people who are loving and learning your word? That deacon knows the odds, but keeps on praying for a miracle. She gives her most energetic decades to the church, refuses to give up when other people get bitter and move on, not because she is loyal to the building, not because she is loyal to her memories, but because she is faithful to the orders that her Lord has given her. 
Such a deacon knows how hard it is to choose to exult in the Lord and rejoice in the God of our salvation, but when she is able to drill deep and tap into that joy, that's the deacon through whom the comfort of God will flow. Because when that deacon has tasted of the Lord's comfort personally, when she finds joy in the midst of her faithfulness, then as Paul was able to comfort others with the comfort he received from Christ, that deacon will be instrumental in bringing God's comfort into the lives of others. Because her heart is truly serving God. For some, they think that they're like that deacon when they're not. For some, loyalty to their church is just a stubborn hoarding of kingdom resources. Their service doesn't lead to joy but frustration because their hardships give them a right to lecture others or so they think as they drive away people, the few people who remain. This talking down to others is a consolation prize they give themselves. When looking down on others is your only consolation, then you know you are not like John the Baptist. Look in verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. For this reason, my joy has been fulfilled. In the midst of doing unfulfilling ministry, John's joy is already fulfilled. How? When the results you get are unfulfilling, how can you keep from being frustrated? John says his joy has already been fulfilled, and it's because John knows the order of things. We do not do ministry for the satisfaction that it brings. We are first satisfied by God, and then we respond to God's grace by doing ministry for God's sake. John doesn't need affirmation from having a big ministry. His affirmation comes from knowing Jesus and what Jesus has done for him. John doesn't get joy from doing a big ministry. His joy comes from thinking about Jesus accomplishing his mission. This already fulfilled joy, this ability to rejoice greatly at the bridegroom's voice, is a gift that God wants to give to us. Oh, how God wants to give it to me because how foolish and desperate I look to God with all of my performance anxiety, with all of my focus on proving that I am worthy of my position. Oh, how God pities my jealousy, how he mourns my impatience, and how he is waiting for me to mature. For my sake, how God wants me to be more like John the Baptist, already joyful, even before anyone responds because my heart responds to Jesus. Already fulfilled, even before I accomplish anything visible because of Jesus' finished work on the cross. How Jesus wants me to have a joy that is in Christ. Instead of experiencing my self-worth going up and down based on how I judge myself or how others judge me, how God is inviting me to stand on the solid rock of Jesus, confident that I have been bought by the blood of the Lamb. God is generous. These frustrating seasons are proof that God is generous. For the sake of us receiving a true joy, God sometimes brings hardships and droughts that make us give up on the deceptive joys of performing well. Why is God not allowing me to perform well and have visible signs of success? because he is truly generous and wants me to discover the only true joy, that of being already fulfilled by knowing what Christ has done for me. If we had such joy, we would not just be marked by passion, but also by peace. People would not just note how hard we're trying, but they would see the ease in our spirit as we do it. In some churches, People are trying too hard, as if by our effort, we can help the world be born again. When a woman is in labor, a good husband is in sync with his wife. He's holding her hand or allowing her to gouge his hand with her nails. He is helping her push. 
He is empathetic, attentive, he is involved, but he should never be louder than his wife. He should never be sweating more than her. Like, come on, girl, push, push. He should not be wild up more than his wife. Because in his humility, he must never forget the real work is being done on the other side. A good advisor focuses on building trust, making information available, being fully present. He doesn't become too pushy for his point of view like an overbearing salesman. In his humility, he never forgets that the decision is the responsibility of the client. I was uh, at a store just looking at pianos, and the salesman was too much of a salesman, thinking that it was his decision to help me make my decision rather than being present, supplying information, and building trust with me. And so I was like, mm, never mind, <laughs> not interested, not interested. That is sometimes what happens when the church tries to witness to a world and forgets what a role is. In our work at church, we are to come alongside God who is at work. We are to be present to God and sync with God, attentive to God. But we never crowd out God. We are always to honor God's work, God's role. When we are in right relationship with God, we will spare no effort, but we will do it with ease. We will not be red in the face yelling, Do you know how much I am sacrificing for you to have an opportunity to hear the gospel? knowing that we are given a chance to minister by the grace of God, who is already drawing all to God's self, knowing that no person can come to Jesus unless God is at work, we serve with expectant joy because we know that the price has been paid not by us but by Jesus. We know that the real work is being done not by us but by Jesus. And so the peace and the ease in our spirit tells others that this is the work of God. Evangelism is not a contest. It's not beating someone at a mental or spiritual tug of war. Most of our work is just to pray and to ask God to be working. Then when we share our testimony, when we answer questions or hear concerns the best that we can, we trust that God is at work. And when people come to Christ, we're not like, I did this. When we people come to Christ, we confess humbly that it was God that drew them not us who pulled them. Jesus won them over, not us. Worship leading, prayer leading, preaching, it should not be too sweaty of a task, as if the church is fueled by the sweat and tears of those who hold the microphone. It is a dangerous and deceptive thing when the preacher has zeal and passion without joy in Christ and faith in his finished work. When the preacher is desperate to get a response from the congregation, the congregation and the preacher become codependent. And the Holy Spirit is crowded out. And the name of God is taken in vain. And everyone gets tired and ultimately disappointed. But when we are in right relationship to God, there will be a passion for excellence, but there is also an ease in our spirit of knowing that everything is grace. Everything is truly from God. When we have joy from Christ before anyone responds, and when it is by grace of God that we minister, then we are like John. And like John, we will begin to honor Christ. Verse 28. You yourselves are my witnesses, John the Baptist says, that I said I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. Only the person who has joy in Christ can truly be one that prepares people to meet Jesus. And that's why God allows John and John's disciples to undergo all of their hardships. John's disciples experienced the hardship of being a part of a struggling ministry with declining membership. And through their experience, they are challenged to learn what it means to serve God with a joy that is already fulfilled and not dependent on the response of others. Why do I share these things on this Sunday? Is it to prepare you for 20 years of drought? 
I have every reason to believe I am addressing a church on the verge of breakthrough. I believe we are months away from greater numbers of people filling the sanctuary. It's kind of easy to say because college kids are coming back. And it is right to be joyful at the thought of seeds sown in the past being harvested in months to come. It is right to be joyful at this building being filled with worshipers. But I want to make sure that we have joy for the right reasons. If we have joy just because the crowds return, then Jesus will get lost in the crowd. And if you don't have Jesus, what are you offering to the crowd? If you say that you're doing God's work when you're just loyal to your family traditions and you're just trying to recreate old memories or trying to prove your relevance, then you are using God's name in vain. And your activities will vaccinate the crowds and keep them from catching the true gospel. Your activities will vaccinate the crowds and keep them from catching the true gospel. If you love the crowds more than you love Jesus, for the love of God, send the crowds away. Please go to a church that is ready. We've got work to do. Do your elders know their Bible? Do they read it as God's word with hunger and reverence and see it as authoritative in their life? If they don't, what are you going to do about it? Do your deacons know their members? Do they pray for members by name, knowing their joys and sorrows? And if they don't, what are you going to do about it? Do your members know Jesus? Do they come wanting to embrace and honor Jesus? If they don't, what are you going to do about it? These questions are hard. It's a lot easier to say, how do we update the website? How do we plan a new activity? But the willingness to be humbled and broken by these questions is the essence of being willing to decrease. And it's only a church that is willing to decrease that will see Jesus increase in their midst. It's only such a church that will be saying with John in verse 30, Jesus must increase, but I must decrease. He must increase. I must decrease. This is important because the following verses, it tells us that we are serving one who is high above every other. And we are serving a world that is needing to hear a spirit-filled testimony because whosoever believes in the Son has eternal life, whoever disobeys the Son will not see life but must endure God's wrath. So much is at stake. So much is at stake. We must learn how to have Jesus increase and us decrease. Some churches are big and some churches are small. But it is important that this church learn faithfully to serve God. Outwardly, it doesn't matter whether many or a few come to this church, but when we say with all the faithful saints, he must increase, I must decrease, then with profound joy we will know that somehow all are going to him. May that be our joy as we serve together in these coming months and years. Would you pray with me? God, we want to get something out of Sunday. We want to get something out of Sunday. We would prefer for it to be Jesus. We would prefer for it to be hearing a word that makes us love Jesus more. But we have to get something out of Sunday. If we are not given the precious life-giving intimacy that we need with Jesus, then we will settle for feeling powerful by belonging to a large and vibrant organization. We will find our comfort and find our energy, if not from the promise of Jesus Christ with us, then from the visible signs that hundreds of people are gathered with us. God, would you help us to choose wisely what we use to be happy and satisfied from a Sunday. If we are not getting Jesus, help us to settle for nothing less and help us to say, I will not labor for a food that spoils. I will not labor 
to build a church that is only drawing attention to itself, I will be someone that says, I must decrease because I need for Jesus, His presence in my life, to increase. I will lead this church into a decrease, a decreasing of our self-esteem as we humble ourselves, as we confess our sins and brokenness, that Jesus might increase in this place. As we pray those prayers, as we do ministry without heart, which will help us to be able to look out and find profound joy because of Jesus, and as our joy is in Him, may it be that through our participation in the gospel, that you would be proud to say all are going to Him for your pleasure, for our satisfaction. These things we ask in Christ's name.